We are now on the record. This is a matter before a disciplinary hearing panel appointed by the Missouri Supreme Court Advisory Committee in the case of N. Ray Kimberly M. Gardner, Missouri Bar Number 56780, case number DHP-21-005. This disciplinary hearing panel is comprised of Ms. Cheryl Butler, a layperson, Attorney Beth McCarter, and myself, Attorney Keith Cutler, as the presiding officer of the panel. All members of the panel are present, and we have a quorum. At this time, will counsel for informant and respondent please make their entries of appearance. Um, Alan Pratzel, a chief disciplinary counsel, the informant. And I'm Sam Phillips for informant. Michael Downey for Ms. Gardner. Paige Tongate for Ms. Gardner. And the record should reflect that Ms. Gardner also appears in person. Yes, she does. And information was filed with the Missouri Supreme Court against the respondent, Ms. Gardner, alleging certain violations of the rules of professional conduct. This hearing is being conducted pursuant to Missouri Supreme Court Rule 5.15, which provides that the hearing shall be conducted for the purpose of determining whether the respondent is guilty of professional misconduct. The record will reflect that this hearing is being conducted in person in courtroom SO-1 of the St. Louis County Courthouse in Clayton, Missouri. Uh, the panel thanks the 21st Judicial Circuit for allowing use of its facilities for this proceeding. For the protection of the parties, the witnesses, the participants, and those in attendance today, and to safeguard the integrity of the disciplinary process, there are certain rules, procedures, and guidelines that we will follow for the duration of this proceeding. I will share those rules, procedures, and guidelines with you at this time. These rules, procedures, and guidelines will be strictly enforced and violation of these rules could result in removal from these proceedings. So please pay close attention and govern yourselves accordingly. Under Missouri Supreme Court Rule 5.31, any members of the media who desired to record or photograph any portion of this proceeding were required to submit a request for permission to do so in writing in advance of this hearing. Nine such requests were received as follows. St. Louis Public Radio, KMOV-TV, Missouri Independent, Missouri Lawyers Media, Trilogy Films, KTVI, KSDK, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and the Associated Press. Given the number of requests received in order to conduct an orderly proceeding while recognizing the public nature of these proceedings, the panel has decided under the authority granted to it by the Missouri Supreme Court in Rule 5.31 to utilize one pool videographer to video, video record this proceeding, which is KSDK, one pool audio recorder to audio record this proceeding, which is St. Louis Public Radio, and one pool photographer to take still photographs, which is T.L. Witt on behalf of Missouri Lawyers Media. Those three media outlets are identified in this panel's order on request for media coverage dated April 7th, 2022, as amended on April 8th, 2022 and they have been notified of their responsibility to provide access to the other media outlets that submitted timely requests for media coverage. Except for those three identified media outlets under Missouri Supreme Court Advisory Committee Regulation 5.37 F7, no one else in this courtroom may use any device capable of audio 
video or electronic recording were capable of broadcasting, filming, televising, photographing, or otherwise transmitting information, including by text, email, by posting, by tweeting, or any other online post or electronic message. That means that no cell phones, no tablets, no laptops, no smartwatches, or other devices may be used at any time in this courtroom, and all such devices must be powered down and turned off. So this would be a good opportunity for anybody to turn off their cell phone, to turn off any such devices. This prohibition also applies to anyone viewing this proceeding in one of the overflow rooms, except members of the specific media outlets I mentioned earlier. Members of those identified media outlets may use a laptop only in the media overflow room, but only for note-taking note purposes, and not for recording, transmission, or any other function utilizing internet access. In addition to Missouri Supreme Court Advisory Committee Regulation 531F7, St. Louis County Local Court Rule 11 also requires that all persons refrain from broadcasting, televising, recording, or photographing in any areas of this courthouse, including this courtroom and any corridors of the courtroom, unless specific permission has been granted by the Circuit Court of the City of St. Louis. Persons violating these rules will be subject to removal from this proceeding and would not be allowed to return. This proceeding is being conducted under the authority of the Supreme Court of Missouri. As such, rules of appropriate decorum and order shall be observed at all times. There should be no talking in the gallery while the hearing is in progress. Any members of the media or the public who need to leave the courtroom during the proceeding should do so as quietly as possible so as not to disrupt the proceeding. Any person leaving the courtroom during the proceeding will not be allowed re-entry until the hearing is in recess. The sequence of the order of these proceedings will be that we will start with the informant and they will make uh, the informant's presentation and then we will hear from the respondent. The respondent will make her presentation. I anticipate taking a mid-morning break around 10.30ish, give or take, for about 15 minutes. Uh, we will break for lunch around noon. We will resume in the afternoon uh, at a time I will announce, which will likely be around 1 or 1.30. And then we will conclude for the day around 5 o'clock if the proceedings uh, continue to that point. For the record, there is a protective order in place. Therefore, counsel are reminded that pursuant to Rule 5.31C6, any document filings and exhibits should be appropriately redacted, and any witness testimony and arguments of counsel should be in accordance with the provisions of the protective order. <coughs> Council, are there any pending motions that need to be ruled on? Uh, no, sir. There are not. Before I invite counsel for informant to proceed with this case, are there any other preliminary matters that the panel needs to address? Mr. Cutler, um, I would like to uh, request leave of the panel to file an amended information in the case pursuant to Rule 5.15D. Is there any objection from the respondent? There is no objection. Right. I'm going to ask our uh, paralegal, Dory Foot to hand out copies to the panel and to Mr. Downey.
by the way, uh, and, uh, the original of this amended information um, is being contemporaneously filed with the advisory committee in Jefferson City um, through uh, the Legal Ethics Council at their office. The amended information filed by the uh, informant is hereby received. Any other preliminary matters that uh, the panel needs to address before informant begins? No. No, Mr. Cutler. Council for informant, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cutler, Ms. Butler, and Ms. McCarter, Mr. Downey. Um, I am, again, uh, Alan Kratzel. I'm the informant. I'm Chief Disciplinary Counsel for the State of Missouri. With me today as co-counsel is uh, Deputy Chief Disciplinary Counsel Sam Phillips. Uh, first, I would like to address the context in which these proceedings and this hearing arises. The Supreme Court of Missouri has jurisdiction over attorney discipline matters pursuant to M the Missouri Constitution, Missouri Statutory Authority, and Supreme Court Rule 5. Under Rule 5, this court has delegated to the Chief Disciplinary Counsel the authority to investigate allegations of professional misconduct against Missouri licensed attorneys and to file formal charges based on that authority when it finds probable cause to believe that an attorney has violated the Missouri Rules of Professional Conduct. When formal charges are filed, the Chief Disciplinary Counsel is the informant and the subject attorney is the respondent. In addition to this authority, the Supreme Court of Missouri has delegated to disciplinary, disciplinary hearing panels the authority to conduct an evidentiary hearing on the Chief Disciplinary Council's charges and to make findings of fact, conclusions of law, and a disciplinary recommendation to the Supreme Court of Missouri. The Supreme Court of Missouri has the ultimate authority to decide all discipline matters. This attorney discipline case is instituted pursuant to Supreme Court Rule 5. The informant is the Chief Disciplinary Counsel and the respondent attorney is Circuit Attorney Kimberly Gardner. Attorney discipline cases often involve factual and legal issues that appear at first glance to relate to underlying civil or criminal court cases. That is the situation here. The allegations in this case arise from Circuit Attorney Gardner's office's prosecution of then Missouri Governor Eric Greitens in a criminal matter that Circuit Attorney Gardner and her office voluntarily dismissed on May 14, 2018, before the case was tried. More specifically, the charges in this case relate to Ms. Gardner's and her office's handling under Ms. Gardner's supervision of certain documents and information related to the office's investigation into Mr. Greitens' alleged criminal conduct, including whether certain materials created by Circuit Attorney Gardner, her office, or their contract investigator, William Don Tisby, and his firm, Antera, were properly disclosed to defense counsel are listed on a privilege log as not subject to disclosure. To be clear, this attorney discipline matter is focused on the conduct of Circuit Attorney Gardner. It does not relate to the propriety or impact of Mr. Tisby's or Antera's conduct. In addition, this discipline matter does not suggest that there was any misconduct related to Circuit Attorney Gardner's or her office's role in the grand jury indictment of Mr. Greitens or to the adequacy of the evidence in the under underlying case. Nor does this discipline matter address the credibility of any witness or the credibility of defendant Eric Greitens. Instead, this is a unique matter related to a specific case with unique circumstances such that the resolution here should not be tied to other cases without similar circumstances. The procedural posture of the case is as follows. The informant chief disciplinary counsel initiated an investigation in this case in July 2018. As a result of that inve investigation, the informant found probable cause to believe that Circuit Attorney Gardner had engaged in professional misconduct and filed an information against Ms. Gardner in March 2021. Circuit Attorney Gardner, represented by counsel, filed her answer to the information in May 2021. The the informant today has filed an amended information in this case. The parties engaged in discovery over the past several months, but more recently, the parties engaged in extensive discussions regarding a possible stipulation as to agreed upon facts, agreed upon ethical violations, and an agreed upon recommended discipline to this panel and to the Supreme Court of Missouri. The stipulation will be offered into evidence this morning by the informant and Circuit Attorney Gardner 
as Joint Exhibit A. The stipulation contains the party's agreement as the findings of fact contained in the joint stipulation at paragraphs 1 through 68. The stipulation contains the party's agreement as the conclusions of law contained in the joint stipulation at paragraphs 69 through 73. And the stipulation contains the party's agreement as to a recommended discipline with 15 pages of sanction analysis. By agreement of the parties, the joint stipulation itself serves as Circuit Attorney Gardner's answer to the amended information. I will not attempt to, I will not attempt to summarize the agreed upon findings of fact as, con and as contained in the joint stipulation. The facts as contained in the document speak for themselves. As to the conclusions of law, the parties have agreed in the joint stipulation that Circuit Attorney Gardner violated rules 4-3.3A, 4-3.4A, and 4-3.4D of the Rules of Professional Conduct in her handling and supervision of the Greitens case. The parties have agreed to recommend to this panel and to the Supreme Court of Missouri that, a, that Circuit Attorney Gardner be reprimanded for these serious violations of the Rules of Professional Conduct. In agreeing to this recommended discipline, the informant has engaged in, 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 in an extensive investigation and has considered other relevant sources of information and guidance, including the American Bar Association standards for imposing lawyer sanctions, the decisional law from the Supreme Court of Missouri, and applicable aggravators and mitigators present in the case. The informant believes that the recommended discipline fulfills the primary goal of the attorney discipline system, not to punish the respondent attorney but to take whatever action is appropriate to protect the public and the integrity of the bar. In a moment, the parties will offer into evidence the joint stipulation of facts, joint conclusions of law, and joint recommended discipline. The joint stipulation is intended to be comprehensive and addresses key issues regarding Circuit Attorney Gardner's conduct in the Greitens case. The joint stipulation is supported by relevant exhibits from the Greitens case that are attached and incorporated into the joint stipulation. The document with exhibits is 680 pages. The panel may wish to inquire of Circuit Attorney Gardner regarding the conduct identified in the stipulation. At the conclusion of the evidence, the parties respectfully request that this panel consider, deliberate, and accept the findings, conclusions, and recommended discipline as set forth in the joint stipulation, that the panel prepare a decision in accordance with the joint stipulation, and that the decision be filed with the chair of the Missouri Supreme Court Advisory Committee pursuant to Supreme Court Rule 5.16, subsection E. After the panel's decision is filed with the Advisory Committee, the informant will file the complete record of the Supreme Court of Missouri. The court will then decide what next steps are appropriate. As always in attorney discipline cases, the ultimate decision as to the appropriate result in the case will be in the hands of the Supreme Court of Missouri. Thank you. I don't know if Mr. Downey is going to make a statement at this point or so. Very brief one, yes. Mr. Cutler and members of the panel, this is to confirm that Ms. Gardner does move jointly with the uh, informant for acceptance of the stipulation. And as indicated there, we ask that you uh, consider, deliberate on, and accept that uh, stipulation. This has been considered by Ms. Gardner with consultation from counsel. She understands the seriousness of the charges. She understands uh, the admissions in the stipulation, and she understands the recommendation for a reprimand. We also ask that at the end of considering it that you do enter a recommendation to the Supreme Court uh, consistent with the stipulation. And we do understand that the Supreme Court ultimately has full discretion in what it will do in this case. Ms. Gardner is also fully informed of those facts. Thank you. If it uh, please the panel, at this time I'd like to offer into uh, evidence of the party's joint Exhibit A, which is the uh, stipulation with exhibits uh, that I mentioned during the opening statement. And we join in that motion. Right, Exhibit A will be uh, admitted. Uh, 
I should also mention that um, a, this is the original document. A copy of the joint stipulation uh, by the parties is contemporaneously being filed with the advisory committee in Jefferson City, along with an electronic copy of the document in case there's any uh, request from the media for copies of, of the document. So I believe that uh, that should be done uh, momentarily over at, uh, in Jefferson City. With that uh, admission of uh, Joint Exhibit A, uh, informant has no other witnesses, no other evidence, and would rest its case. All right, thank you, Mr. Pratzel. Mr. Downey, anything from the respondent? Just very quickly, a point of clarification. The original uh, stipulation is in a white binder, so I wanted the record to reflect that. Um, Beyond that, no, there's nothing further from respondent, although the panel does have the opportunity to ask questions of the respondent, and Ms. Carter is prepared to answer questions of the panel at this time. Uh, the, the panel does have some questions for Ms. Gardner. Uh, she is welcome to answer them from her seat there, since there is a microphone there, if, if counsel's okay with that. We are, yes. Right. Uh, good morning, Ms. Gardner. Good morning. You can pull that microphone closer to you so you don't have to read so much. Okay. Would you, do you want to go? Yeah. She'll go to the podium. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have a question about the. May I? May I interrupt? I'm so sorry. Um, should the witness be sworn? Correct. You swear the witness, please. Yes, I do. All right, so let's start over. Good morning, Ms. Gardner. Good morning. All right. Um, I have a question about the uh, videotape uh, that was referenced in the um, stipulation. Uh, it's my understanding that at point A, a video recording was made of an interview. Uh, at point B, it was determined that the video could not be played where a conclusion was reached that it was not properly recorded. And then at point C, it turned out that it actually was recorded. Is that the overview? Do I have that correct? Yes, you do. Okay. Uh, my question kind of focuses on point B. Um, was there a problem with actually finding a device to play the recording of the video or how was the conclusion reached that it wasn't properly recorded versus it was properly recorded, we just can't get it to play back? Well, there was um, a malfunction in the equipment that we're not used to recording using that equipment. And when we had our team look at it and try to um, play the video, it did not work. And we had multiple people try to play the video. Was it recorded on some type of medium, like a disc or card, or do, do you know that? It was a regular, um, I think, recording device. So I think the it, they had a scan disc, I guess, that was in the device that at the time um, was shutting off. So it was something with that scan disc that eventually um, it was determined that it did properly work. But there still was missing pieces in the beginning of the video. Prior to the point where it was determined that the video could be played, even the beginning parts not being able to be played, but the rest of it being played, was the uh, defense advised of the existence of that recording? Well, I think we have to go back. It never worked in originally in the beginning. It would come on and turn off. And so we had multiple people try to work the video. We assume the video did, did not work and did not record the actual interview. Uh, at what point did you conclude that and why? 
in the beginning when we tried to play back the video because we were going to have the video transcribed, it would come on and turn off immediately. So we could not even view the video until we had someone else try it one more time. And then they determined that it did work and they did something to it. I don't know what they did to get it to work, but it was shutting off because of the scan disk. Was it your understanding at that time that because you could not get the video to play, there was really no duty to disclose it in discovery because it wouldn't play? No, it never worked, so it was nothing to disclose. So that was the original thought process. If it didn't work, how can we disclose something that didn't work? Okay. By disclosing, we have a scan disk that we tried to record something, we didn't record it. Uh, we just want to let you know that it exists. We can't get it to play. Uh, we don't think it recorded, but just to let you know, was was that ever discussed in your office? I think the, the point, I'm trying to clarify, we don't normally record these type of interviews. We don't manipulate the video recording. Usually our IT person would do that, those things. And at that point, an individual who does those normal course of business things could not get it to work. And from there, I deduced that it did not work. It did not record. What was it that prompted your office to take another look at the video to see if it could be played? Well, we wanted to see if we can try to get it to work again to make sure that it it actually could not work. And when we did, it ended up working and we did our due diligence to turn that over immediately. Right, I understand that at some later point you determined that it could. What was it that prompted you to take another look at it? It was nothing that prompted us. We do that all the time. This is a very um, compressed case. So things were happening really fast. And we, again, tried to get this video to work. And that was pretty much it. If I let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the uh, exhibit, I believe it's exhibit one to the stipulation, the bullet points memo. Um, there was a representation made in a court filing that the, well, let me back up. There was a annotated notes by the investigator on bullet points that you were prepared, correct? Yes, it was. M Mr. Gardner, if I may correct, it's actually Exhibit 2 is the bullet points. Okay, thank you. So the record is clear. And at some point it was mentioned in a court filing that those bullet points on which the investigator annotated were actually prepared by the investigator. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Uh, those bullet points were actually prepared by you, but then copied by the investigator onto another document? Is that those, correct? Those documents were reformatted by the, by the investigator at the time, that those could not, at the time, look like original um, anything that I end up making, but that's what you're referring to, yes. So the bullet points were your original content. He just reformatted them? Yes. Okay. And so at the time you mentioned in the court filing that those bullet points were prepared by the investigator, is that what you meant by that or? Yes. Okay. You weren't intending to convince the court that you didn't do the original bullet points? No.
as it relates to the discovery and the disclosure of all records and notes of any interviews conducted with any witnesses, um, was there a formal process in your office for categorizing those things? Because that's a typical category of information that is requested in discovery. And there's also an independent duty to turn those over, correct? Yes, it is. All right. So was there a process in your office for segregating those things so that when that request came in or when it was time to disclose it to the defense, everything was all there together? As again, I stated that this case was very a fast track case. This case was um, like no other case that we've ever dealt with. And at that time, we did our best to make sure we turned over appropriate uh, notes, the actual notes were turned over that I had um, handwritten at the original interview. Those were turned over immediately. And so we did our best to make sure we had a process to do that. But of course, this was a very compressed um, discovery schedule as well as um, hearings every day. So um, yes, we had a process, but unfortunately that process came up short. Okay. And when you say this proceeding was one like no other, other than the names of the people involved, uh, the process itself in terms of there is an allegation, you investigate it, you collect data or information in that investigation, and then you make the charging decision. That process is basically still the same, correct? Yes, but I mean, I'm being transparent and honest. This was not like a case, like a typical case where a prosecutor is given opportunities to turn over. You have a continual discovery turn over as you make efforts to turn those things over. This was a very compressed schedule. This was um, hearings every day. This was um, uh, motions filed every day. And at this time, because of the type of case it was, um, we had very limited people handling this case because of the type of case it was. The compressed schedule under which you were working, was that something that was agreed to with the judge and counsel, or was that something that was just imposed by the judge? Well, there was a scheduling order, but that or the scheduling order was never followed to the T. Because if you look at the scheduling order, we had um, certain time periods when things were uh, discovered that we could turn things over. But there was also uh, an order for different motions and hearings. We had hearings every day. The hearings that you had on the motions, were those pursuant to the scheduling order, or was it just someone would file a motion, so then you have to have a hearing? And it would come up at, uh, it was at both. an ad hoc basis? It was both. Okay, thanks. All right, so back to the, the, the process itself. Yes, you were on an, a, a compressed schedule, um, but you said you had processes in your office for categorizing and segregating any information that needed to be disclosed and turned over to the defense, but it, it broke down in this particular instance. Uh, why, well, why is that? Well, let me say, I mean, what we're here for is five pages of notes that I took that I did not believe that I, one, had in my possession anymore, as well as those were my mental impressions. So do, throughout the very fast-paced schedule, we made reasonable efforts to turn over everything, but those things were not turned over in this case. The compressed schedule um, kind of raises a question in my mind. If this was a situation that lasted, let's say, over the course of a year or two, then it might be a little easier to forget a year later that a year before you had some notes from an interview. But because of the compressed schedule, everything happened so quickly, it seems to me it would be less difficult to forget you took notes a couple months ago as opposed to a year later. So does the fact that this was a compressed schedule, doesn't that lend itself to the conclusion that it probably should have been on everyone's active memory that there were these notes that need to be turned over? Like I said, um, that was a mistake on my part, and I made reasonable efforts to turn over everything that I had in my possession, and those five pages were not turned over. Right. 
Uh, I don't have any further questions for you at the time, Ms. Gardner. Uh, Ms. Butler, do you have any questions? No, I do not. Thank you. Ms. McCarter, do you have any questions? Just one or two follow ups. Um, actually, just to make clear, I wasn't positive about the answer to this. Did you or your office actually tell opposing counsel that, the, that you had videoed the interview try, when it wasn't working? To the best of my recollection, I don't believe so because we didn't believe it worked at that time, so no one viewed anything to turn over. Okay, so you didn't tell them we videoed it, but we can't get it to work. I believe we did uh, tell them we videoed and it didn't work, um, but I don't remember at what point we did disclose that to them. Okay, you don't know if it was just after you got it to work again? Or no, it was, again. it was before. Well, we did extension training for our team as well as uh, making sure we understand what is disclosed, discoverable. Um, we basically use this case to understand that when you have uh, lawyers, when you have notes, make sure you turn those over and have a process of retaining those notes, making sure they're documented on our discovery um, memos that we file with the court. Um, we upgraded our um, e-discovery so we have a documentation of what goes out to different opposing counsel. Um, so we've taken this case as a, a learning lesson of how we have to make sure nothing um, falls through the crack. But at the same time, we do our due diligence to work with our young attorneys as well as executive staff when there are issues to raise those concerns to the executive staff members. Well, I just want to clarify, we, I did turn over my, my notes, my handwritten notes. So those were turned over immediately. Okay. Were the, you produced the bullet points after the interview, correct? Yes. Okay. And regarding the deposition of Mr. Tissabee, which it, to me is a troubling aspect of this case, how would you handle that any differently today, knowing what you know? I think, you know, first of all, I mean, the way the deposition went was because originally I was not supposed to be at the deposition with Mr. Tisby. We had other counsel that was supposed to be there that was st stuck in an airport. So I had to do my job to, one, protect my office and to go forward with the proceeding. So, one, um, as we tried to get a continuance to get us time to get our counsel there, to, that was going to handle the deposition, um, one, I would push more for a continuance to be prepared for the deposition, as well as making sure um, the investigator had everything that they needed for that deposition. Yes, he was. Yeah, I mean, it just would be impossible then, the way that the deposition is, to not know that these were young people. And I guess my question is more, how would you handle that any differently? Well, like I told Mr. Tisby, and this is not about Mr. Tisby, you know, this is about Kim Gardner, and Kim Gardner does not represent Mr. Tisby or anyone in that type of deposition. What we told Mr. Tisby was to tell the truth, and that's what we did. I mean, that's all we could do in that instance because I was not his lawyer, so I could not advise him. He was the investigator. Yeah, but, you know, of course he was the investigator, and, of course, I believe Mr. Tisby was mistaken, but it was not just Mr. Tisby making mistakes. Mr. Tisby was blindsided by 
the opposing counsel where his personnel file was leaked that he was thrown off. And so, you know, if we take the context of the deposition, we have to understand the egregious tactics at the, dep at the deposition that the opposing counsel used to fluster Mr. Tisby. So that's where that context, you know, we should look to that too. You know, Mr. Tisby made some mistakes, but Mr. Tisby is, you know, who he is. I mean, he's a guy that was an investigator for a case where, you know, our police department would not step in or anyone would step in. So I appreciate Mr. Tisby. Yes, he made mistakes, but I'm not here about Mr. Tisby. I'm here about Kim Gardner. Yeah, that, and that is my real question is, would you handle that situation any differently then than you did then? Like I said, I would tell whoever was in the deposition to tell the truth, but I can't tell them what to say in their deposition. Ms. Gardner, at the time this was going on, um, how many people total did the circuit attorney's office employ? Total, probably over 125 people at the time. Of those 125 people, approximately how many were attorneys? Uh, about... Thirty or attorneys. Are those numbers still roughly the same today? Um, a little bit more. More in total and more attorneys? Um, we have a roughly around the same amount of attorneys, but we have a little bit more staff. After the video was produced to the defense, uh, were there any points in time after that that you uh, represented either to the defense, uh, to the court orally, or to the court in writing that there were no other notes uh, that you had that had not been turned over to the defense? At the time, at probably one of the hearings, we did make those representations in court. And which set of documents or notes would that have been referring to? Like I said, this was a very fast-paced case. Um, at the time of those statements, we believe we had turned over um, the notes that were originally taken by myself, handwritten, were turned over. Um, we had grand jury transcripts that were eventually transcribed, which were turned over. We had different documentation, emails, um, photos that were turned over. Um, so at the time, there's different parts. I don't know which part you're talking about, just to clarify for this body. Um, but at the time, we believe we turned over everything we had in our possession at that time. But discovery was ongoing. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. I don't have any other questions. Any panel members have any questions before we allow Ms. Gardner to take the seat? All right. Can thank just, you very much. Can I say something? I'm sorry. Sure. Just want to say thank you to this panel. To you know, hopefully you consider, you know, our stipulation. I just want to thank the community members here, my staff, my team. You know, my office. We do a lot of great work. You know, um, we are have a thankless job. So, you know, I want to say hopefully, you know, because I am. The elected official, you know, this record reflects the hardworking men and women in my office that work hard every day without fanfare or accolades. 
So when we talk about a prosecutor, you know, we have duties, but you know, in in this case, um, there were th some things that were not done in the best, um, I guess, um, in this instant, but I take accountability as a leader and hopefully, you know, my office can get past this, but it's not about my office because they work hard. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. Mr. Downey, anything else from the response? Not at this time, Your Honor. Uh, is there anything in, uh, I guess, rebuttal from the informant? Uh, no, Mr. Cutler. All right, um, at this time, the panel will take the matter. Sorry, were you about to say something? I, I think Mr. Pratt wanted to say something into the hearing. No, you I, go. I do have something very quickly to say then, if that's okay. okay. I may follow it up, but you go ahead. Okay. I thought there was going to be a statement about media relations after, and I do have something to say about that. Um, Circuit Attorney Gardner appreciates the work of the hearing panel and its consideration of the stipulation. That stipulations and its findings were prepared with careful work, both by the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel and Ms. Gardner and her counsel. The stipulation speaks for itself. Ms. Gardner and her counsel will not speak with the media immediately after this hearing. And Ms. Ms. Gardner also does not intend to make any public statements regarding these proceedings. Instead, Ms. Gardner will respectfully wait for the recommendation of the hearing panel, and we hope, entry by the Supreme Court of an order that conforms with the stipulation. And Ms. Gardner will continue to direct her attention to the important work she has been elected to perform as the Circuit Attorney of the City of St. Louis. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cutler, I'll only add to that that um, I, our office, as a matter of policy, doesn't comment to the media before, during, or after the time from the court, so we also will not be speaking to the media. Anything else from the parties? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, Mr. Cutler, the, um, if it's okay with the panel, I would propose to take the original white binder um, and, and hand deliver it to uh, Legal Ethics Council and the Advisory Committee on Wednesday, if that's okay with Mr. Downey and the panel. That is fine with us. All right, that's fine. Anything else? No, sir. No, Mr. Cutler. Uh, Mr. Carter? Ms. Butler? At this time, the panel will take the matter under advisement under Supreme Court Rule 5.15. Uh, we uh, will make a recommendation to the Supreme Court uh, within 30 days after today. Um, with that, unless there's anything else, uh, this proceeding is adjourned. And we are now off the record.